This is Map Musings. In this episode, we're going to check out the linguistics of Canada. Where do Indian students go to school? All the gold in the world. And a historic map of Cologne, Germany. Does it smell good there? Local maps, regional maps, international maps, nonsensical maps? You're tuned into Map Musings. I'm the Muser, and these are the maps. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment below. Thank you. To start us off, we're going to look at some linguistic maps of Canada, showing us words that essentially are the same thing, but we're going to see that terminology changes throughout the country. So this first one we're going to look at is a vacation house or summer house. For much of Western Canada, the term they use is cabin. This term cabin is also shared with Newfoundland and Labrador, out on the East Coast. Remote and rural Northern Ontario tends to use the word camp, while French-speaking Quebec uses chalet. Ontario and much of the Maritimes use the term cottage, except for Cape Breton in Nova Scotia, which uses the term bungalow. Forks, knives, and spoons are called cutlery in Western Canada, utensils in Quebec and New Brunswick, and silverware in Nova Scotia. Your electricity bill has a different name depending on where you live in Canada. Some say hydro bill, while others say electric bill. Also, a significant portion of Newfoundlanders say light or a power bill. And maybe the strangest of them all is what a sweater with a hood is called. In most of Canada, it's a hoodie. Unless you live in Saskatchewan, where it's called a bunny hug. That sounds so cuddly and comforting. Anyone out there call it a bunny hug? If so, let me know in the comments. This map shows us where Indian students go to study outside of their home country of India. The number one location is the United Arab Emirates, followed by Canada, the USA, Australia, Saudi Arabia, and the United Kingdom. I have some serious questions for the students who went to Sudan. Why did 10 students go to Sudan? If you are a native English speaker, then this map using data from 2018 will be your guide of which countries to visit. It's showing us the proficiency of English in these non-English First Nations. For much of Europe, it is over 50%, with the highest concentration being in the Nordic and Scandinavian countries, with the lowest areas being Eastern Europe. The Philippines and Malaysia do quite well, as does South Africa and Argentina, even Chile. English is the language of business, so a lot of countries put a high priority of their populace learning English. This map shows us different energy pipelines in Europe. This map doesn't show the recently destroyed Nord Stream Pipeline 2, but it does show Nord Stream 1. It really shows the dependence that Europe has on Russian energy. This is an aerial map of Cologne, Germany from 1570. You can see various details around the city, including a massive cathedral. But I wanted to show you this because you can see the wall built around the city. Well, if we look at a modern day satellite map of the city, you can still see the outline of where that wall once stood. Not actually this area, which is a buffer zone between the city core and the suburbs, if you will, but actually this area. Essentially, that wall today has been replaced by Route 9, which partially encircles the city up till about the Rhine River, and is a tree-lined promenade, a main ring road. In modern day, that Cologne Cathedral is still there, and it's amazing just how much the city has grown outside the boundaries of the former walls. I mean, <laughs> based on that 1570 map, the whole city, with space left over, was inside those walls. Next, we have an extremely detailed map of Denver, Colorado. It is made using LiDAR, which according to the USGS, is a light detection and ranging technology used to create high resolution models of ground elevation with a vertical accuracy of four inches. This is done with GPS and a laser scanner, as well as a navigational system mounted to an airplane. USGS plans to have the entire United States, including Alaska, mapped in this type of technology by 2023. This shows us the various outcomes of how the 2020 US presidential election may have turned out. 
if you split it by different categories. So according to this, if only women voted, Democrats would handedly win, and if men voted, Republicans would handedly win. But then it changes if it only looks at white women, where it also shows Republicans would win. And there are other different categories here that you might enjoy looking at. Here is a highly detailed topographical map of New Mexico. Can give you a good idea of the lay of the land and its many elevation changes. The eastern portion of the map here is the Staked Plains region, one of the largest tablelands in the United States, with an elevation rise of about 3,000 to 5,000 feet above sea level, which is about 10 feet per mile. The furthest south subrange of the Rocky Mountains is the Sangre de Cristo Mountains here, which also house New Mexico's tallest peak. Wheeler Peak. You can actually see that indent there on the map is actually the Rio Grande River, and that's going to flow south past Albuquerque here, past Las Cruces, and down into Texas. Other significant ranges here are the San Andreas Mountains, the Sacramento Mountains, and the Black Range. The Black Range was known for a lot of different mineral mining camps. This southern region here would be the Sonoran Desert, which continues south into Mexico. And at the very top northwest corner of the map, we have just an extension of the Colorado Plateau. I would point out the Pecos River, but you can't really see it here on the map, but just know it runs past Roswell here. I love these kinds of maps, but this one just geographically didn't explain a lot. It shows it, but it doesn't label them. I wish it labeled it so the average person would know these locations. They don't call New Mexico the land of enchantment for no reason. You can't trust everything you see on a map. This is the exact same location on four different mapping platforms. And let's just say that none of them are correct. The Google satellite map just kind of made up an industrial looking area. Naver, which is a Korean satellite company, just shows greenery, a forest. Bing Maps as well just uses greenery for a forest. And OpenStreetMap just makes up fake roads. Essentially, all these map companies are doing a good job at hiding that US Army base in Seoul. Or maybe it's a giant secret amusement park. I guess we'll never know. This map shows us the number of police officers per 1,000 people in both Europe and the United States. So according to the map, Northern Europe has far less police officers per 1,000 people than Southern Europe or Eastern Europe. Greece has the most with five officers per 1,000 people, as does Croatia. Finland only has one officer per 1,000 people. And some other notables are the UK, Norway, Switzerland, and Iceland, which all have two. 1,000. In the United States, the states with the most police officers are Alaska, Louisiana, Virginia, Maryland, and New York, all with six officers per 1,000 people. This map shows us the gold reserves for several countries around the world, and it inflates or deflates the size of the country depending on how much gold they have. By far the winner here is the United States, followed by Germany, I believe. I'm surprised by the amount of gold that Italy has, even surpassing France. It appears only the top two countries have more gold than the International Monetary Fund, which is this circle here. Here is a detailed panoramic map of Moncton, New Brunswick in 1888. Today it's the largest city in the province, but at the time we're looking at it, it's in its boom years. After having a major population decline in the 1870s, the city only had 600 people, but here, by 1888, the population had risen to 8,000 people. And as you can see, there's a lot of industry going on with several different refineries around the city, not to mention the mass of churches. Some truly stunning churches and cathedrals all around the city, including on this street here called Church Street. I can count like one, two, three, four different churches all on this one street. You can also see a main street forming around Main Street, where the density of the buildings is certainly more than other parts of the city. Also surrounding this map is a detailed look at prominent buildings around the city. Seeing all this activity and buzz would certainly get people excited to come here. Bridgeton, Maine is a beautiful little town surrounded by lakes. Here we see it in 1888, well before it became a destination for seasonal recreation. The town at this time was a small industrial center of sawmills, gristmills, textile mills, a shoe factory, even a brick manufacturer, all of which and more are conveniently marked on this map. The population of the town was about 2,600 people. In 2020, the population had grown to 5,418. Really a pretty and idyllic looking little town. And when you look it up closely, you're actually surprised at just how much 
industry is hidden in this town. You will also notice that there is no main rail line as the railroad company actually went around the town, which I'm sure was no treat for the businesses in the town who probably really wanted the railway to come. Really cool panoramic map here of Bridgeton. U.S. News and World Report does rankings each year about the best states to live in by quality of life. They determine these factors using healthcare, education, economy, infrastructure, opportunity, fiscal stability, crime, as well as the natural environment. All this comes together to help them create a ranking of the best and worst states to live in. Which states have the best quality of life? So this is their 2023 rankings, showing us the quality of life for every state. Since at least 2017, Washington state has been the number one state in the country for quality of life, meaning it excels in pretty much every category they follow. And this year, second place is Minnesota, followed by Utah, New Hampshire, Idaho, Nebraska, Virginia, Wisconsin, and Massachusetts. Florida rounds out the top 10. Want to give a quick shout out to Idaho, which keeps moving up the rankings every year. It's an up and coming place for sure. Impressive. Honestly, can't say I'm surprised by anyone in the top four here. Washington, of course, Minnesota, Utah. But now let's check out the bottom 10, starting with Kentucky, South Carolina, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Alaska, Alabama, West Virginia, New Mexico, Mississippi, and Louisiana as the worst. Most of these states struggle with healthcare, have really poor educational systems, and have stagnant economies. Opportunity is limited, and crime usually isn't too great. Now Alaska on this list is a little bit unique because a lot of people are in remote locations and don't have access to the same opportunities that a lot of other states in the lower 48 might have. A lot of these people probably love their life away from the hustle and bustle of the lower 48, but because their village of Norvik doesn't have a hospital, they have to fly to either Fairbanks or Anchorage to get services. That of course would lower the score, and because there are so many remote villages in Alaska, the score tanks really fast. Now as for the other states on this bottom 10, there are several reasons why they're at the bottom, but that's not really what this video is for, is it? We're looking at maps. Thanks for watching Map Musings. I'm the Muser, and those were the maps. Be sure to like, subscribe, and comment below. We also have a Patreon which you can support. In the future, when we get Patreon supporters, they will be shown here. Thanks again for watching, and have a great day. Chuck Norris once went skydiving, but promised to never do it again. He figured one Grand Canyon was enough.